Welcome back to the show, everybody. The one and only John Deaton sits down with Chief Legal Officer from Coinbase, Paul Grewal, and I've got the highlights you need to hear. Oh, the hypocrisy and contradictions inside the SEC. It is quite, quite revealing. You need to hear it, and I'm going to give it to you. Somebody roll that beautiful intro. Digital Perspectives with Brad Kimes. Come on in. Welcome back to the show, everybody. You can follow us on Twitter and YouTube for exclusive content. Right now, $1.21 trillion market cap for crypto. The market is up 1.3%. Good afternoon, everybody. 28100 plus for Bitcoin and 1874 for Ethereum. Tether market cap, $82.4 billion plus, And we see that $0.43 cent XRP is stuck right now. 1.1% on 24 hour, a little more than 7% on the seven day. We'll keep an eye on it. But if, until you do... I trust capital investing in crypto gold and silver using your IRA the only thing better than buying crypto is buying tax-free crypto and you could do it right here and let me tell you something else too because this is an IRA company and they offer crypto IRAs IRA companies have to be in compliance and that's exactly what I trust capital is and as a retail investor this is one of the ways you can find institutional custody for your assets because they are a crypto IRA provider. Make sure you check that out. Now listen here, this is 43 minutes of kick-ass, but I grabbed the highlights out of it that are really kick-ass that you need to hear, and I'm going to bring it to you right now. I want to thank John Deaton and Paul Grewal from Coinbase, who does the best job that he can to kind of give you why Coinbase delisted XRP and about how it's not off the table at all, that it may be relisted. Let's start right here and take a listen about the IPO that Coinbase had and the clarity that they were under when they did it. Yeah, I'm a common sense kind of guy. So it's, it, the way I look at it is if, if the SEC believed in any way that Coinbase was out there selling unregistered securities to the public, they would have never allowed approval of an IPO. Is that fair? Absolutely right. Um, not only is it baked into their statute establishing their authority to Uh, allow companies like ours to list. But um, there's a part of the process, John, once the decision has been made to allow that listing to take place in which a company can file for something called acceleration. It's a it's a it's a technical issue, but ultimately it it allows uh, a company like ours to um, shorten the period of time beyond uh, approval to uh, 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 when we actually get to list And and, and a key consideration in reviewing that acceleration request on top of the underlying request is, is this listing in the public interest? So uh, to suggest somehow that that process did not consider whether or not our business was legal and our process for reviewing assets was legal misses the mark entirely. Quite compelling when you hear it from the chief legal officer from Coinbase, isn't it? You are going to hear remarks that are just so candid coming from Paul Grewal here about the SEC really being in control of a political appointee. I'm paraphrasing, but that's really what's being said here. Quite impressive comments. This this conversation is remarkable. And I want to thank John Deaton for having it. Let me cue up the next spot for us right this moment. Here we go. Yeah, and I want to make sure, uh, Mr. Graywall, that I understand the framework. My understanding is that in 2019, the SEC published a framework for determining digital assets, whether they're securities, it's still on the website today. And what coin, and there it is on screen. And what Coinbase did was take that framework, make it more detailed and assign numerical weightings to certain factors. Is that fair? That is fair. You know, the guidance we received back in 2019 was helpful. Um, but it, it certainly did not address any and every circumstance that might apply to any particular digital asset that wanted to list on Coinbase. And so we developed our own methodology, again, uh, working with our internal experts, uh, working with lots and lots of lawyers at, 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 at impressive, distinguished law firms to come up with a, a process that could work as we reviewed dozens and dozens and over time, hundreds and hundreds of assets that wanted to list on our platform. And after reviewing all of those factors 
that we laid out as part of our process based on that guidance. Uh, it turns out that very few assets actually make it all the way through. Something like 90% of the assets, John, wash out or fall out for one reason or another because we have such exacting standards and are so committed to making sure that we do not list digital asset securities until we have a registration from the SEC, which is one of the reasons uh, we find ourselves in the conversation with the commission that we are in right now. I agree 100 percent. In fact, I want to show you one of the factors in that 2019 SEC sure. framework uh, right there where it says with respect to a digital asset referred to as a virtual currency, it can be immediately used in payments as a substitute for fiat. As you can imagine, most of my followers in the 76,000 XRP holders, that describes XRP itself <laughs> as, as well as other tokens. And, and my understanding is that what you all did at Coinbase was take a general framework and make it more stringent That's than exactly what the SEC right. published. That's exactly right. Well, you know, and, and the SEC language, of course, is guidance. It's not a binding authority. Uh, we would like to see rules in place. We ultimately like to see legislation that clarifies this once and for all. But yes, we took the guidance from the SEC. We erred on the side of caution, John, because we do not want to list securities, period, end stop. And so where there was a close call, um, where we um, concluded there may be a question, we would pause on the listing and wait for further guidance from the SEC or greater, greater clarity from the courts. Um, it's all about uh, being conservative and taking the longer view that um, if we want to build an, a, a crypto economy that works for everybody, we're going to have to be patient in certain uh, circumstances and wait for more guidance before we can list certain assets. In fact, what I want to do is I want to go back to make sure that the audience and the public's aware that this is no surprise. The, the, the Coinbase framework, the business model is no surprise to the SEC. I want to play you a clip from 2019. This is pre-IPO for everybody out there. And, and in this clip, you have Amy Starr, who is a senior official at the SEC at FinHub. And you have, at the time, Dorothy DeWitt, who is general counsel for business lines and markets at Coinbase. They're on a panel together. Let's just play a, a quick. We went, implemented it. We felt very confident in the robustness of the analysis and constantly, um, uh, you know, ensure that it's, A, constantly ensure that it's as up to date as possible and B, run our digital assets that we list against it on a periodic basis as a part of their lifestyle management. So so we did that and we, we feel like we've done as robust a job as we can to um, work within a quickly evolving industry and identify tokens that we can list. And we've using that framework, we have also um, uh, rejected tokens. Uh, so we have done both. And we've been transparent about that framework and the process you know, with our actual and potential regulators. So, uh, and Amy Starr nods her head like, yes, that's exactly right. I mean, this is the problem with the SEC, right? It's based on the political appointees. We're seeing a different direction and a different way to run an agency, which is supposed to be run the same way, no matter who's in it, protecting investors, not hurting them. Keep listening to this clip because it's going to run into a very, very important segment in just one second. Take a listen. Again, there we are two years before the IPO is approved. You have senior official at the SEC, along with one of your attorneys at Coinbase, discussing the framework, discussing it. And to follow up on your point, back then, Dorothy DeWitt talked about how you reject tokens. And I think you just said 90 percent, Paul? More than more than 90 percent, John. Don't pass our tests. Don't pass our standards and don't get listed on Coinbase. All right, I want to play one more quick clip because I think this just highlights the frustration. I want to ask you a question. This is the chairman of the SEC before he was chairman of the SEC, sir. And even for Ripple and uh, Ether, or it, maybe it's, you know, EOS or NEO or something, you know, it, but for the big market cap ones, there needs to be clarity in the market. So that was April 23rd. 2018 and so I, I have to ask you is you're the you're the top attorney at the largest exchange in the united states of america how frustrating is it for a company trying to do its best to be compliant when you're faced with this type of lack of clarity well it is frustrating and not just for 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 coinbase but for the entire industry including i suspect john many many of your followers and listeners look the fact of the matter is that professor gensler 
has spoken out numerous times about the marketplace. He has said, for example, on more than one occasion that more than 75% of the market is not even impacted by a Howey analysis because they are in fact not securities and therefore don't fall within the jurisdiction of the SEC. And even after Professor Gensler became Chair Gensler, after Coinbase was allowed to list as a public company in May of 2021 to the Congress, John, to Congress, Chair Gensler said that there are no market regulators applicable to cryptocurrency exchanges like ours, and therefore that Congress needed to act. So to Congress, he said that. You know, this is the hypocrisy going on inside of this agency. And I tell you, I can't understand for myself, how is it that coin or, or the U.S. government hasn't cut off the funding to this agency to get them back in the lane they should be in? All right, Paul, I want to I want to talk about something that's part of the public record. It's something that I made a big deal about in my amicus brief. Um, so I have to ask you. Um, whether or not you're limited in answering, uh, I don't know. But we know that Coinbase literally went out of its way in, in January of 2019, met with the SEC, again, this is public record, that to discuss XRP and the potential listing of XRP. And um, after that meeting, a month later, XRP got listed on Coinbase. And so I'm just going to have to ask you, is there anything that you can share with us about that January 2019 meeting? Uh, or is it because of potential litigation, you just can't comment? Well, John, unfortunately, I can't get into the specifics of that meeting. What I can say is that your timeline is correct. And I'll, I'll let you draw the conclusions from that that uh, you deem appropriate. Well, I'll tell you something. It, it, that, that I don't know about you, and I, I'll draw my own conclusions, as Paul Grewal says here, but I don't know about you, but it sounds like they were punked by the SEC. You take that off of there, or else is what that... Now, I'm deriving my own opinion out of that, So, but it damn sure feels like it. Now, he goes on to say that they basically froze having XRP. They stopped offering it, but it doesn't mean that it won't go back on the exchange. I want to take you now, because I don't want to get this to get too long, but I want to take you to a spot that you're really going to want to hear on the way out here. I went on record to say that 90% of attorneys would have recommended Coinbase or Kraken or anyone else to suspend trading. So my first question is, did I underestimate the 90%? <laughs> well, I can't, I can't speak to a specific percentage, but I think it's fair to say that, look, um, we take any allegations from an important regulator like the SEC seriously. And so, um, you know, that, that certainly was something we paid very careful attention to. At the same time, uh, we were very explicit when we made our decision that we were pausing our listing we were not making a final uh, determination. And um, I can say this much, John, uh, we are paying as much or more attention uh, to the goings on in Judge Torres's court as, as anyone on the earth, um, because we're very eager to see clarity finally brought to them to the marketplace. And the confusion that has been sown by the SEC's very expansive view of primary and secondary sales um, uh, as being implicated uh, by by its allegations. We want to see that confusion addressed once and for all. Really well said right there. But let me take you now to another clip that you need to hear here. And I want to get it lined up one second here. Uh, will it be the courts that give us the, the answer, the central legal question around crypto and classifications of digital assets? Or do you think Congress will, will step in before the courts, appellate courts make a decision? Well, I, you know, look, the, 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 the legislative process is certainly um, slow and uh, often, um, you know, subject to forces beyond uh, certainly my pay grade in terms of understanding uh, and control. But what but but look, um, I am an optimist that there are members of Congress who, who understand these issues, who want to get it right, who, who want to see America continuing to lead. And so um, we are investing a lot of time um, educating lawmakers and providing in assistance and insight to the extent it's useful to help them draft legislation that will get us there. In the meantime, though, John, uh, if there's no other place to go, the courts are always the, 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 the part of government that's uh, the last resort for people seeking justice. And whether it's you know, Judge Torres 
uh, whether it's the Second Circuit, whether it's the Supreme Court, I can't say. But I do think we're going to get clarity one way or the other, even if it's going to take us all, it's, it's, even if it's going to take a lot longer than uh, any of us would like. I think that is a, a great statement, and I believe we're going to get clarity too. And I think that this case with the SEC versus Ripple is going to be right where it begins. And I think it may take a road to go too, obviously. But nevertheless, let's take a look at this next clip here for you guys to hear. I want you to hear this as well. Right at this marker here. One second here. Let's start it right here. And one reason only, and the only reason I get to interview is secondary market sales. You know, I, I a lot of people classified me as the XRP attorney, even though I made it clear I own more Bitcoin and even own more ETH than I did as far as XRP that had the SEC said the same allegation against ETH. I would have acted the same way and I'd represent ETH holders instead of XRP holders. Um, and but had the SEC limited the allegations to Ripple and Ripple sells, I just wouldn't be here. And in fact, when I filed my motion, the SEC came up with this theory. And I want to share with you, I, you probably have read this already, but this is their response to my motion when I wanted to get involved. And they said that the XRP traded even in the secondary market is the embodiment of those facts, circumstances, promises, and expectations, and today represents that investment contract. Now, if you notice, as a federal judge, would, would, you, would you be struck when you see that there's no citation after always, that? Sentence? <laughs> always, John. Uh, my, my antenna go up, to put it gently, whenever I see a, a, an assertion as broad and as unqualified as that one with no supporting citation or evidence or, or case law uh, to point to at all. And, you know, I have to just, just to comment a bit on the, on the substance of, of, of the claim. It completely ignores, John, what the Supreme Court said in Howie, which is before you even get to the four factors that we all know so well, investment of money in a common enterprise, all of that, there has to be what? There has to be a transaction, a contract yep. or a scheme, right? That's in the plain language of Howie. Where on earth is there any transaction, contract, or scheme applicable to the parties in a secondary market transaction? There just isn't one. And that's Paul Grewal, chief legal officer from Coinbase, telling you that he understands clearly that XRP is getting road rough shot from the SEC over in that case, just as John Deaton did, which is why he took the case up to begin with. And, right. and, and no serious scholar would, or, 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 or lawyer or student of, of this area would, would claim otherwise. It's a remarkable thing to read in a brief submitted to a federal court. Wow. And this is a former federal judge himself right here. Uh, and you could hear the disdain and the, uh, pro, and, the, uh, and the reading of that right there. Now, John Deaton does a great job of asking uh, uh, Paul Grewal about XRP versus Algo. Listen to this. No, it, it is, and it, it struck me, obviously. And, and Coinbase, in their Wells Notice response, discusses secondary market sales and what you and I have just went over and how they don't, do. it just doesn't meet the Howey test in any way. And, and I have to talk to you. I want to share with you, because I'm sure, you know, and get your response. My, the people I represent, XRP holders, uh, you know, every argument that you're making about secondary sales equally applies to XRP. And yet XRP was suspended. And then we see a case against Bittrex where the SEC says Algo is also a security. And of course, there isn't a suspension of that. And so do you understand where as an XRP holders that that they get frustrated or even angry that that they're penalized. Not that anyone wants you to delist Algo or suspend Algo. Let me make that clear. Uh, I, I do, just John. What's your, what's your thoughts on that, sir? No, I do understand that frustration. And look, um, I get it. People's uh, people people can be passionate about these issues, and the rhetoric can sometimes get heated. But I understand where folks are coming from, and I also can understand why I can feel like there's a double standard that's being applied um, uh, in, in in a variety of circumstances. The law evolves, circumstances evolve. As, as the chair himself likes to say, facts and circumstances constantly change. Um, but I can understand where that frustration is. 
at the same time, I, I want your, your listeners and followers to understand um, we, we are committed to applying the law and standing up for the rule of law for everyone, including holders of XRP. It's one of the reasons, John, that um, we submitted an amicus brief yep. in the case against the Ripple defendants um, in, in order to support one of their particular defenses, the fair notice defense that was raised, which I think ultimately is something they could and should win on at trial if it gets to that. Um, others spoke to some of the other issues, including the secondary um, um, markets point that, that you've raised and been such an articulate voice on now for many, many months. I think the main point, John, for all of us is that um, this is a team sport we need to play. Um, we're, we're, we're up against the most well-resourced adversary on the entire planet. That's the United States government and in the form of the Securities and Exchange Commission. Um, we've seen now, as you've highlighted, they're not a, a, above um, misstating the law and offering assertions without support mm. if it helps them achieve their objectives. Again, I don't question the motives of the staff, but I do think right. there are some powerful political forces here that require that we all work together, that we find our common ground, and that... Um, we, we, we claim our government back for ourselves um, uh, and not allow this, you know, one single part of this one regulator to run roughshod over something we've collectively worked 230 years for as a country. To Amen to that. Now, I want to get you to hear because this is really what it comes down to here. And sometimes it's the villain itself that brings everybody together, right? It really is because, you know, we all understand Coinbase didn't have a lot to say about it for the last two plus years when the SEC was suing us. But now that they're in the, in the boat with us, we are all in this thing together. And it's time to focus on the fact that the real problem is Gary Gensler and the way he's running it from a political appointee position and point of view. And I think that John Deaton, as always, sums it up best right here. Let me get this lined up for us here. Well, in any way they want to or can, uh, because this is a fight that we all need to be a part of, uh, even if we have our own particular interests uh, ultimately in mind. No, I agree. And listen, I, I've fought for transparency, so let me be transparent. I, I am a Coinbase customer, and I, <laughs> I actually have uh, I own shares in Coinbase, so I want everyone to, to know that. I'm a fan of what you're doing. That doesn't mean I have to agree with everything that Absolutely. Coinbase does or that you say you don't have to agree with everything I say, but you are 100% correct. We are on the same team, and if there's anything I can ever do to assist Coinbase, uh, I'll be right there. Um, and I want to thank you so much for uh, for taking the time, Paul. Appreciate well, John, it. I just I want to say thank you, not just for this opportunity, but for all that you've done for all of digital assets and crypto. Uh, you're, you're a leading voice in this fight, and uh, we're all lucky to have you as part of it. No doubt about it. And I'd like to add what James Murphy, Meta Lawman, has said on our channel here when we've done conversations and interviews. And I believe that James Murphy said it right. John Deaton has changed history when it comes to crypto and cases and getting clarity. With the amicus brief filings and class action behind him, he has changed history in the way that you go about fighting these cases for clarity. And I believe it can't be overstated, no doubt about it. Look, not financial advice from me or anyone else. It's just our digital perspective. Somebody hit that like and subscribe button. We'll catch you on the next one.